Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another episode of Nuggets News. Today, welcome back a special guest, and that is economist Steve Keane. I think it's the third or fourth time you've been on now, Steve, and I think your episodes and predictions have been spot on. Um, Turning Japanese was probably the favorite one of mine, and here we are Mm -hmm. in this world where you know, the Fed have dipped in and started buying their junk bonds and their junk ETFs. So I think the world is turning Uh Japanese and we're going to get through all of that today. But um, today, for the viewers at home, I wanted to start off and go back to sort of where money has changed and just really briefly Uh give that overview for people at home about when we went off the gold standard. And I kind of think of it as that that period up until sort of Greenspan era and then the noughties, and then we had the GFC, and the last 10 years mm. have been the you know zero interest rates, print all this money. So do you want to maybe walk people through the brief version of how you see money has changed? Well, basically, money hasn't changed. Money has been a double-entry bookkeeping uh, activity for about 500 years, and uh, there have been different attempts to control uh, how much money is created, which is what the gold standard was about to some extent. Uh, But overall, it's always been a case of you have a double entry bookkeeping ledger. Uh, If you and I make a transfer between our bank accounts, there's a negative in my column and a positive in yours. They balance out. If you borrow money from a bank, they work a positive in the loan account that you have with them and a positive in your deposit as well. Uh, That creates money, but it also creates debt. If governments run a deficit and they finance it by central banks purchasing their bonds, in a very roundabout way, they're forced to do it these days, that creates money. So it's all been double entry bookkeeping. And uh, what is so frustrating is people thinking, oh, God, gold really is money. Bullshit. Gold, gold has not been money. Gold, the gold was used to settle international accounts because we, that in those days we didn't have an international currency. Mm. Um, uh, even, even when we, then we had the first, uh, the, 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 the Bretton Woods system. Uh, first of all, that was a mistake. Uh, Keynes did not want to have the American dollar as the reserve currency. That was the bloody Americans imposing it because we're big Americans and we beat everybody in the world. Yeah, da 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 da. So they imposed their their currency as the international currency over Keynes's objections, where he wanted to have an international currency invented. He called the bank or. And that would have been, again, double entry bookkeeping. Every country would have had an account at the, what, what, what became the IMF. It, was, it had a totally different function in Keynes's vision. That would also have been double entry bookkeeping. So you would have had settled your accounts in bank cores in international trade. Instead, we had the bloody American dollar. That was a disaster right from the outset because, first of all, it gave the American financial system enormous power. Mm-hmm. They could buy assets anywhere in the world because they had dollars, whereas everybody else had to have their own national currency. Secondly, it ended up uh, overvaluing the American dollar, which is one reason why American manufacturing became uncompetitive with the rest of the world. Yep. People had a demand for dollars, which was at least 30% above, maybe even 50, I mean, double the demand it would have been in the absence of them being the reserve currency. Well, that again strengthened the American financial system and undermined the manufacturing system. Mm-hmm. So it's been a disaster all the way through. But nonetheless, all, all the way through, money has been double entry bookkeeping. And that's the, if, if people get their heads around that, then, you know, enormous amount of confusion disappears, but unfortunately, most people haven't got their heads around it. Yeah, yeah, we will get into gold later on. I know Steve has differing views to what a lot of people in the audience um, are going to have and whatnot as well, but that's what we like about having different guests on the channel. Um, one thing we've been talking about with our audience and doing some whiteboard videos and whatnot is the way money's created, and that's kind of been mm. what your, I guess, career's been dedicated to in a lot of ways, mm. and people at home are pretty familiar now with you know, we've got our notes and our coins that the government or the treasury can actually mint, and you have those in your wallet. Mm. That's easy to understand. Then there's this thought process that central banks create money when they, they print this money to buy bonds off the government and they you know then they give that money to the government. But now we're getting into this talk around, well, why can't government just skip that step and spend money on the things that it needs? And then we've obviously got the retail banking sector when they you know give out a loan, they're expanding the money supply. I'm not sure if that's the right term, but is that broadly the different classes of money in your arguments? Yeah, I mean, there's two, there's two fundamental ways you can create money in a domestic economy. One is by banks uh, lending out more than they take more than they take back in loan repayments, and that means the amount of debt uh, increases exactly equivalently to the increase in the money supply, uh, and the debt the debt is uh, is owed by the person who gets the money as well. So we have that 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 doesn't increase the net financial assets of the person getting the money, but it does increase the money in circulation. The other is by government spending more than they get back in taxes. Mm. And this is one of the most irritating things about people being amateurs about this. They go, where's the government? How's the government going to pay for it? It's going to do a bloody double entry bookkeeping entry. The, the, if you have a central bank, which is owned by uh, a national economy, it's actually the, the formal owner of the central bank is the treasury. 
And if the, if the central bank makes any profits, which it, you know, most of them do, on their bond holdings, then they remit those profits to the Treasury. So if the Treasury is issuing bonds, uh, it's only the re legal uh, political requirements that mean that you've got to sell those bonds to the financial sector. Mm. But then the central bank, uh, uh, the central bank can is always involved in uh, what we call open market operations, buying and selling uh, government bonds and now other sorts of bonds as well yep. off the financial sector. And if they net buy government bonds off the financial sector, that in a roundabout way is them buying bonds off, them, off the treasury. And all they do is they say, OK, you've created $100 billion worth of bonds. Uh, we're going to put $100 billion in your treasury account and we're, we're going to record our assets are having rise, risen by the $100 billion of bonds you've issued. And it's just double entry bookkeeping. And there is no problem about creating money. In fact, it's the easiest thing to create. And that's actually part of the problem. People try to make it difficult to create and think that'll make a better world. Or they think it's really hard to do and therefore this is going to burden the future. Bullshit. The only burden is some accountant's going to get a sore finger typing on a keyboard. That's the only burden for the future. And I know when I, I, I made this mistake when I first went down the rabbit hole and you're watching all your documentaries and whatnot, there's this big bad government debt and to some degree right. I guess well this is where I want to get your thoughts on it at what right. point does it become bad where Trump goes well if I can spend money you know more money the, the better basically and do you risk inflation at that point you know what are those counter arguments for and against the, the big debt oh, the, 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 yeah the, the, the main thing is the consequences of doing it not whether it's politically or te technically feasible to do it or not yeah. so people get up and saying oh it's technically impossible for the government to pay its debt in the future garbage uh, that is literally saying it's impossible to use a spreadsheet. Okay, that's about as sophisticated that argument really is. So the government can create as much money as it wishes. The central bank, uh, when it when it credits, uh, if you look at QE, QE sh should have been the wake up call to people who come out with this argument, because where, did you pay any taxes for QE? Mm. Okay, where was the QE tax that was levied to make it possible? Zero. Okay, it's simply a case of Bernanke and his friends saying we're going to buy eighty billion dollars worth of bonds off the financial sector every month uh, for you know an indefinite period. It lasted about about eight years, but every month they were saying, okay, we're putting eighty billion dollars into your accounts because this financial institution they have accounts at the central bank. So bang, we work eighty billion every month net in those accounts and on our ledger side we show we've got 80 billion dollars worth of bonds yeah so it's just accounting it is it is it was no there was no taxation necessary to create that money and equally the same thing could apply now during the coronavirus if we wanted to get money to people's bank accounts directly it had simply been an accounting operation it is it is not it is not something that requires taxation to finance it and this belief that it does require taxes and therefore we burden future generations is why we ended up not having the nurses and the ventilators we needed when this crisis hit absolutely and i think there's a couple of other points that um i've learned over my journey about the velocity of money in particular when you hear that the mm -hmm. the debt can never be paid back because a you know is bigger than b or whatnot the velocity yeah. you and i can pay each other and pay another business and that's We've actually seen the velocity of money really slow down. So yeah, it's been tragic. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, there's a lot of currency creation, money creation, whatever you want to call it. What was it at one point? You know, a trillion dollars here, a trillion dollars there, and that's. I think the treasury actually has a trillion dollars on hand, as well as all these other programs that they've implemented. Mm -hmm. So where is that money sitting at home for people to understand that? And at what point does it risk becoming inflationary? Well, I mean, the, the risk we face right now is deflation, not inflation. Um, and it, there, there's, there's one of the elements that people's thinking about uh, banking is driven by reading economic textbooks and believing them. Uh, and you, you get this argument about banks need reserves in order to lend, and the government can control the amount of money by controlling the reserves and controlling what they call the reserve ratio. That's garbage. It has been garbage forever. Uh, and I've been part of a, a protest group of economists arguing that case for the last 50 years, starting with a guy called Basil Moore back in the 1970s making that case that banks don't lend out reserves. Uh, finally, the, the central banks after the financial crisis, the Bank of England, the Bundesbank, even the Australian Reserve Bank, uh, the Bank of Norway, uh, all these banks you wouldn't ordinarily expect to side with the radicals came out and said the textbooks are wrong. Is that the there is no money Basel more. three changes or whatnot? Is that the... No, 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 it's just reality, okay? The, the ban banks cannot lend from reserves. And um, I'm actually writing a cartoon book on this front right now to try to get the point through. But if you, if you think about reserves, people think, think lend from reserves. Okay, reserves for an asset. 
if you take money out of the reserves, your assets fall. Therefore, either your liabilities or equity falls by precisely as much. You can't lend from reserves in the first place. It's simply what reserves are there for is uh, if you imagine you and I like being a part of a triangle. So you and I've got our bank accounts here and then there's this, a bank at the top that we, we do the transfers through. So if I pay money to Nugget, there's minus 100 here and plus 100 here. But if you happen to go bank at a different bank, you're in another, you're in another triangle. I'm here and you're over here. And the central bank is up the top. Now, the account that actually does the transfer is not our accounts. Now, it's the reserve accounts of those two banks. Mm -hmm. So if you bank with the Commonwealth Bank and I bank with the uh, with Barclays, then there has to be a transfer of funds between Barclays and the Commonwealth to enable the transaction to occur. And that's what reserves are for. They're, they're a clearinghouse for banks. So the whole idea that banks lend out of that is like a believing that you when you put uh, lubricating oil in the car, that's what actually gets it to go forward. No, it lets the engine turn without, without uh, you know, crunching the cylinders, but the, the, the reserves are like lubricating all and not the petrol. And the mistake people have made is treating it like it's the petrol. And that's the textbook that lead them astray. So a two-part question then, the Basel you mentioned, and what is the Basel three changes that came about? And more recently, we've actually seen mm -hmm. them come out and say, you don't need the reserves. Is that kind of proving your point? Yeah. I mean, the reserves are simply unnecessary for bank lending. Um, uh, there's actually a very good paper by John, John's last name, I'm trying to, trying to drag it out of my back of my brain at the moment. It's hard to do this when you do it live. But uh, John Carney wrote a very nice uh, piece saying loans create a lot more than deposits. Uh, it's written about four or five years ago. It's a very nice little argument. And what he says is the re people think banks need deposits in order to lend. It's the exact opposite. Lending creates deposits. So if you take out a loan with the bank, uh, for the, say for a million dollars to buy uh, some slum in Erskineville, which is typical in Australia, the, at least it was last week, um, then what the bank says, that's a great idea, here's a million dollars nugget, by the way, you owe us a million dollars. So that the, the, then, then you then spend that million buying it off the person who's flogging the property to you. Yeah. So you make a transfer of your million from them to, the, to, the, to the, yourself to the vendor. That creates additional demand. Okay, and that's 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 the basic logic of banks loans create deposits. Then, when you pay the debt back, you are reducing your deposits, and that reduces your loan by the same amount. So, lo new loans create money; repaying old loans destroys money. Yeah. and that actually has a feed-through effect in terms of the velocity of money as well. One thing that I've changed my my mind on, I guess, was the whole notion of bank runs really changed as well recently didn't it when the fed in the u.s came out and said we will print infinitely so again what we've just spoken about do you want to tie in when people talk about fractional reserves and they're going to run out of money and what the fed are doing now how that all sort of ties together well i mean there's it, 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 one one of the people who knows most of this is stephanie kelton who's a uh, a non-orthodox uh, economist and stephanie uh, uh, makes the point that you, it's like saying, saying the Fed can run out of money is like saying a basketball arena can run out of points. Okay, it's just a scoring system, yeah. and so there's the, the whole. The, we, we just have to break this mental uh, disease of believing in fractional reserve banking. And I see people who are really angry about fractional reserve banking. They're angry about a myth. That's like being angry about fairies at the bottom of the garden. Okay, it is literally a stupid economics textbook myth promulgated by neoclassical economists who don't understand money, never have, never will. And yet that's their, their simple way of dismissing the whole idea. Is that what they're doing is they're effectively saying uh, money doesn't matter in the economy. Uh, the only way that money affects the economy is because the government changes the amount of money in the wrong way. And so you need to control the government and it's all the government's fault that there's too much money in the economy or too little. Uh, that's bullshit. It's the, the, the private banking system creates over 90% of the money that's in circulation and their, their actions dramatically affect the level of economic activity. So all this stuff is just a set of myths and textbooks by economists who want to argue that money doesn't actually matter, ironically enough. And then they have this dismissive little idea which says it's all the government. The government's got a vertical money supply and they can change uh, how much that money that they create turns up in the system, but it's all the government's fault. That's what it's all about. Now, I'm sorry, it's the private financial system's fault as well. So when in the past when we have seen um, bank runs, is that the third type of currency we're talking about before? It's a shortage of just physical notes that people want to withdraw as opposed to the, the money that we spoke about. 
Well, then what you have is if you have a, if you, if we, if there are multiple banks in our system, of course, and those banks are all taking uh, speculative positions themselves. And they're also, uh, the, the real way that banks lend is they have assets and liabilities and the gap between assets and liabilities is their equity. And if you start, you start as a bank, you might establish a bank with $100 million. That's your initial equity. So you'll have a- equity of $100 million, assets of $100 million, and liabilities of zero when you start out. Now, as you start creating money, you're actually levering up that equity base. So you might lend $100, $100 million initially. You create $100 million in assets and $100 million in liabilities. Your equity is still the same because you've increased your assets and your liabilities, but your gearing is now one-to-one. Your assets are 100% of your equity. Yeah. If you continue lending it to a billion dollars, you can have a ratio of 10 to 1 to your equity. Okay. If you get to 30 to 1, then you can have literally 30, you can create three, $3 trillion out of 100 billion. Uh, but that then means if any of those loans go bad, you can be in deep shit. Okay. Yeah. Because suddenly those go from good loans, which are being serviced, to bad loans that aren't being serviced. And you've got to at some stage write those loans off. Now, if you write those loans off and you've lent out 30 to 1, then if you have to write off 3% of your loans, you destroy your equity base. Yeah. That's where a bank run comes from. Do you want to talk about what is happening right now and what the Fed are doing? They've got all these fancy you know, names, these new programs, and we're starting to see defaults. We've covered you know, the shale oil industry, for example, yeah. where they've had to step in and buy those junk bonds and ETFs. Is that an example of those banks that lent too much and now are starting to see defaults? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you uh, the whole shale industry I've seen described as just a speculative land play, uh, they're only profitable at above fifty dollars a barrel. Of course, <laughs> when it's minus thirty, it's rather hard to make a profit. Yeah. So somebody asked me what's going to happen to those sometime ago, and I said they'll go bankrupt. End of story. Now, if they go bankrupt, then the banks that lent them the money lose lose their assets. Their assets fall. Their liabilities remain constant. Their equity takes a hit, and a bank with negative equity is bankrupt. That's that's the story. Okay, so but bank, it's actually a brilliant book by a, an ex banker called Richard Vague, uh, who established two of America's major credit card companies. He's uh, you, you won't tell me how much he's worth. He's, he's, in, he's in the billion billion range, but uh, he he was actually made his money uh, when he was working as the manager of a consumer credit section for a Texan bank back in the seventies. And what happened at that stage, because the oil price, first of all, went from $2.50 a barrel to 10 in 1973 with the OPEC, first OPEC strike, and then from 10 to 40 with the second, everybody in Texas was lending to oil companies. Now, of course, then you had a crash in the price. It fell from 40 back down to 10 again, destroying the economics of all those new wells that have opened up. Yes. And most of those companies went bankrupt, and so did the banks. Now, in the middle of all that, the banks said, we've got to offload whatever we can get money for. So they offloaded the consumer sec- consumer division and Richard did his own levered buyout of that and turned it around um, and made a, made, a, made a bomb out of it. So he said, that he, he has this wonderful book called The Brief History of Derm. And this is not, I'm, you know, I'm an intellectual on this front. I haven't run a bank. Richard has, okay? He's really worth reading to get a feeling of what actually happens in banking. And he says, there, 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 there will be waves of, of, of euphoria passing through the banking system. If you're not lending to the oil banks, you're out, you're, you're, you know, you're old hat, you're, you haven't caught up with it. So you'll get these euphoric waves where people lend excessively to one particular industry. Too much stuff is created, uh, too much traditional supply comes on, online. You can't maintain it, it crashes, and then you get a, a financial crisis in the aftermath to it. So all this stuff is out of excessive bank lending. And it's it's not constrained by reserves. This is that always puts the responsibility back on the government. Say it's the government's fault. It's the banker's fault. Yeah. Okay. Richard Vague, is that right, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Strange sure. last name. I we, gonna we, put it, we're going to have a book together called Keen and Vague. We haven't was, done it yet, but we well, keep I was on talking say, I'm about sure it. there's a bad dad joke in there about being a vague dick or something. But um... when I first met him, I couldn't <laughs> help. I, I just got off the plane. For, he actually flew me to a conference in Washington. And I got off the plane because like, I'm feeling a bit vague right now. And yeah. the staff just said, Richard's heard that so many times. But I get keen. You know, God, you're keen. So, you know, we, we do want, we're good friends and we do want to put a book together. He's taught me a lot about the mechanics of banking. And, and that is a beautifully written book. I mean, if people want to understand what actually causes financial crises, that's to me the ultimate reference now. Better than um, uh, Charles Mackay's Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, certainly better than Kindle Berger. So that's the book I reckon. To have a look at that and look at the, a realistic assessment of how banks actually operate and where financial crises come from somebody who's both an intellectual 
uh, and actually manage very successfully several large American financial institutions. Okay. I might uh, get you to send me those and I'll put them in the link yeah. below, guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Next question I have, well, if that is going to happen, Donald Trump comes out and tweets, we're never going to let our precious American oil sector fail. So do the Fed continue to just buy these distressed assets? Do they bail out the companies? Do they wait for them to fail and, and bail out the banks? What do you see happening there? Oh, I mean, that, 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 that's pretty hard to, to pick what's going to happen in terms of the behaviour of people like Trump. It's political, um, though, isn't it? It's not really Yeah, financial. it's political. Yeah. I mean, you, if you, if you, I mean, you know, the other classic saying, if you owe the bank a uh, $100 or $1,000, you have a problem. If you owe the bank a million dollars, the bank has a problem. Well, that's the situation. This is, this is banks being owed a fortune by shale oil producers who are now you know, falling over like you know, faster than flies. In a, in a, um, and they, the banks themselves are going to go bankrupt. Everybody in America could go bankrupt out of this because, again, what was ignored uh, by the mainstream it begins where you can get any classical economics led us massively astray. They completely ignored the level of private debt. That's what actually caused the 2008 crisis, a private debt bubble, which at one stage had credit increasing with private debt changing or growing by 15% of GDP per annum. It went from plus 15 to minus five across the financial crisis. That's what caused the, the negative effect on, on the economy. Um, now, that is all ignored by the mainstream. They actually tried to get banks back to lending once more, and therefore the debt level only fell by 20% after that crisis from 150 to 70 to 150%. And that, that is actually three times the level of debt the private sector was carrying back at the time of the Spanish flu. And what it means is if you can't work anymore, and we have you know, lots of working class people who have renting a property or middle class people with a mortgage, and they've only got enough money in their bank accounts to pay one or two payments if they're lucky. Mm. And suddenly, bang, they can't, and they haven't got any income coming in. The unemployment rate is, what, 20 million people now? Yeah. Um, that's 20 million people who can't pay the rent, 20 million people who can't pay the mortgage. That then means the landlord goes bankrupt. The, 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 bank, the, the bank lending those loans goes bankrupt. Uh, and the payment system breaks down. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very unusual crisis. We've never had anything like this before. And... And the only way to save it is for the government to be injecting that money into enable people to maintain those payments and, and avoid a total crash in the payment system. And now we strike American ideology where you can't do that. That's government interference. I mean, I would like government interference if I was comatose. Yeah. And that's pretty much the state of American capitalism right now. Yeah, and we'll definitely get to that um, once we talk about the um, digital currencies a little bit more. But I just wanted to touch yeah. on, you said uh, private debt is too big um, versus just for mm -hmm. people at home. That's comparing government debt, which is relatively low in Australia. Um, other countries like America have got fairly big public debt. But then we're looking at private debt, which is you know households and corporations as well. This is the thing that I want to dive into when we saw those um, CDOs fail and cause the mm. GFC. Now we're seeing those CLOs, the loans that have been packaged up and the shale, the shale oil patch is starting to fail. Are the CLOs, you know, I've heard stories about how they're being used as collateral for other things and whatnot. Is that a contagion that's waiting to spread? And is it QE to the tune of tens of trillions to stop that from collapsing? Or what, what happens? Yeah, that, that's, I mean, you, you have a whole range of levered positions that have been taken by banks, which were relied upon a continuous uh, cash flow that has now disappeared. So in that situation, uh, the, the entire financial system is on the verge of bankruptcy. And... You know, there's, there's the only way out of it uh, is to provide the cash flows independent of the market system. But now we're striking against you know, ideology and people simply won't do that. Yeah. So that's the, that's, that's the great um, tragedy of, um, of American capitalism. We, uh, we ignore, uh, we've, we've ignored what caused the crisis. We've left the cause of the crisis still hanging around, too much private debt. And now we're having financial fragility and we can't understand why it's having such a severe impact upon the economy. And do you think when people say they won't allow that, that's the whole, you know, Occupy Wall Street, yellow vests, you know, we're not going to allow more bailouts. Even if people demand their own money, that's still got to go through the banks, doesn't it? Like we talked about before, yeah. which is still going to upset people. So that's, do you see that there is going to be widespread civil unrest? Oh, yeah. I mean, if you have people who, like a lot of people, when when they've, uh, when they lose their job, they're still trying to pay the rent. They don't want to get evicted by the landlord. So they pay their rent. They're down to zero money to feed their kids the next month. Then they can't pay the landlord and they can't feed their kids as well. Mm. 
And, you know, if you've got a gun handy, and a lot of Americans have a gun handy, uh, that implies a fairly disastrous outcome. And that's what worries me. We will see enormous social unrest coming out of this. And the only way to prevent that social unrest is to provide a financial flow while the market economy is comatose. And that's what the government should be doing. But of course, Americans are the ones who are resisting it the most. 100%. And, and that's where what boggles the mind a little bit. When you shut everyone down, you say, you know, we've got to go into this lockdown, hard lockdown. What, I didn't seem to have a plan initially. And we were saying it's very easy to even get people to download a, an app these days and send them money directly with the digital ledgers that we have available. Now, central banks are talking about creating their own ledgers, but the technology isn't quite ready yet. But mm. you'll just talk about the, the issues that you see and, and where money is kind of changing the fact that people might have an account directly with the central bank that avoids this step of going government bond to a central bank buying it and then giving that to a bank and it just goes directly to the person. Yeah, that's the um, that's why I like the idea of a central bank digital currency because at the moment uh, the only institutions that have accounts at the central bank are financial institutions and the, and the treasury. In some cases, the treasury has its account with the private bank, but that's the usual story. So you have the the government itself having accounts there and the and the, and the financial institutions. And so if the government wants to make an injection into your bank account, it has to spend. Okay, so it spends first of all by selling selling a bond which it initially sells to the financial sector. That itself can take money which is currently sitting in the financial sector and then spend it through the real economy. So that's actually its own positive contribution to increasing the velocity of circulation of money in effect, as we you mentioned earlier. Uh, but it's also possible for the central bank to buy those bonds off the financial institution and therefore it creates new money which turns up in the government's account. So the government issues, uh, say, $100 billion worth of bonds and let's say the Treasury buys that $100 billion worth of bonds off them, then you have $100 billion worth of cash the Treasury can distribute. Now, how does it distribute that money? Well, at the moment, it's got to go through your private bank accounts. And that is quite easy in Australia because, as you know, uh, we all have our tax accounts at the, um, at, the at the Australian Tax Office. And therefore, the Australian Tax Office knows our bank accounts, and it's quite easy to put an injection into an Australian person's bank account through the private banking system. But if you're in the UK, most people don't have a tax account. Most of them don't even make a tax return. They just pay tax as they go, and then that's the end of the story at the end of the year. So they don't actually have the details to be able to do that. Okay. And that applies in some European countries and some parts of America as well. So I was in favour of establishing central bank digital currencies and giving an account to every citizen, every, every resident of a country, which means that as well as having, you know, like in, say, Australia's case, about 10 financial institutions with accounts at the central bank, you have 23 million. Uh, Australians, each with an account there, which would currently have zero in it. But if the government wanted to do the same idea of, of, of distributing, they wouldn't have to go through the private banks. They could put the money directly into your account at the central bank. And then you could transfer that money from your central bank to your private bank. Uh, you could even have a, the central bank being a payment system. One of the reasons that central banks haven't gone ahead of this, they're worried about uh, be because the payment system would be much cheaper at the central banks did it than at the private banks did it. They're worried about undermining the private banks. Yeah. Now, uh, I, I said, look, just have it ready for God's sake, because um, certainly when I've been working on climate change now, as I have for the last year, and I've seen the absolute garbage that people like William Nordhaus and Richard Toll and Mendelssohn and all the idiots, neoclassical fuckwits, pardon the French, uh, uh, who've, who've done this stuff on climate change, trivialising the impact of it. I knew that at some point the real world was going to take over and say, I'm terribly sorry, uh, it's rather more serious than you lunatics think it's going to be. Uh, rather than can, in in, um, in uh, Nordhaus's case, he said that a six degree increase in temperature would cause an 8.5% fall in GDP. A six degrees increase in temperature would drive human life extinct, period. Um, so when that's when reality started striking at temperatures like you know, one and two degrees, and it was far worse than these idiots argued, we'd have a, a breakdown of the market system. And to actually enable any transactions to occur, you'd have to have a non-market economy that enable that to happen. Well, that's what I was arguing from about, I think, um, maybe September of last year in favour of central bank digital currencies, not because I wanted them to abolish cash. I, I agree with Richard Werner, they, they, they don't know what they're doing in the first place, but just to have the accounts handy so that when the crisis hit, we'd be ready for it. Now, the crisis has hit a lot faster than I thought with the coronavirus. Yeah. Yeah, I, that sort of brings me to the next point about the retail banks not wanting to lose, I guess, the monopoly or duopoly, oligopoly they have over money. Yeah. 
do they realize that each of them can take power away from the other? You know, at what point did government say, well, we can just spend money, we don't really need that central bank? How do banks start to defend themselves? Is that what they're doing now, trying to re- recapitalize and being less willing to lend to each other and whatnot? Is that sort of maybe an area where there's going to be a lot of friction and debate where people haven't put two and two together yet? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is the, the trouble the banks, you know, they're an incredibly privileged position to be able to create money. And particularly uh, when people don't understand how easy it is to do and how you actually do it and think you're actually controlled by a system that doesn't control you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Not that I'm saying most bankers understand it themselves. Most of them can't see the the forest for the trees. Um, They think they actually have to borrow the money that they lend. I've had uh, fairly senior members of the Australian Banking Service tell me that. Uh, That's nonsense because the money they're borrowing is American dollars. When did you get a loan in Australia in American dollars? What they're actually doing is borrowing money long term to beef up their equity because long term debt is is counted as part of your equity, not part of your uh, liabilities. So if you borrow money US dollars overseas, you can boost your equity basis and therefore you can increase your capacity to continue lending. So that's what they're actually doing when they borrow money to lend. They borrow money to increase their equity base to be able to lend much, much more than the amount they've actually borrowed. So. Um, that it's such a privilege and so powerful and the, the wealthiest people on the planet these days are bankers and they shouldn't be. Um, uh, Marx actually did a wonderful stand up of bankers back in the uh, 1800s. He called them the roving cavaliers of credit and said that at various times they get the capacity to despoil the, the productive system and this gang knows nothing about production and should have nothing to do with it. Well, spot on. And what we've done instead is let the bastards take over by letting the level of private debt go through the roof. And that, that is why we've had the financial crisis we've had and why we're so um, damaged by the coronavirus now, courtesy of the financial system as well as globalization. Yeah, I, I just think so many things, even if you knew nothing about banking and the financial system, you look at people like you know, agriculture and farmers that are barely getting by and yet food is so critical to everything. And yet here we have these guys that sit up in... Uh, you know, these offices in suits and keyboards and they're just worth a fortune. But what is their productive, you know, economic contribution to the economy? And I think there's so much that you could erase with with software these days and that's where technology will hopefully eat a lot of their lunch. Well, unfortunately, no, I don't think it will. Uh, Because, again, to think about cryptocurrencies on this front, people I know, you know, I imagine you're in the camp as well, are thinking this is a sign for cryptocurrencies to take over. You can't let cryptocurrencies take over because if you did, people who didn't have cryptocurrencies couldn't shop. So this is a, a classic instance where we we actually need uh, the, the fiat system to get money out there on a, on a per capita basis before, uh, before we have a totally devastating crisis. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm rather skeptical of the... Uh, of the argument that cryptocurrencies will take over here. Uh, but the trouble is, we'll, we're going to let the the, um, the banks continue to get away with blue murder. And yeah. we shouldn't allow that either. Yeah, I, I think the way that more and more people are now viewing Bitcoin or even gold, and again, let's, um, let's dive into that, Steve, and get your thoughts on that. Mm-hmm. People are saying now, with all this money that's going to be created, and again, it's sort of going to the wealthy and it's driving inequality, firstly. Mm. But the way that the the perpetual debt and the interest rates, it's just punish savers and people want some sort of unit of account. Now, maybe gold was some sort of an analog measuring stick over time and now people have Bitcoin, which is this digital measuring stick. They can say, well, if the US's M2 is going to double every five years and I want to save some money, I'm better off saving in Bitcoin and not being diluted fourfold. That's kind of the argument now. Yeah, what do you think about all that? Well, that's, I mean, we talk about money having three functions, a unit of account, a store of value, and a means of payment. Yeah. And what people don't appreciate, most people don't appreciate, is those last two means are in, in, in conflict with each other. If you use money as the means of, 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 of a store of value, it means you don't spend. So the velocity of money falls. Okay? And this is why Gazelle came up with the idea of money having a demurrage. So if you didn't use the money, it would actually decline in value over time. Mm-hmm. And the whole idea was to use that to... Uh, to cause more transactions, to increase the velocity of money, to enable it to do what it's most important to doing, that is to enable transactions. So in that sense, inflation actually is a form of demurrage, accidental, not intentional, okay? But that's what it does. If there's inflation going on, you're likely to spend more. Now, you mentioned the velocity of money a while ago. I might just actually uh, quickly bring up uh, uh, a a chart on that 
Well, while, uh, while you're looking that up, you, Steve, um, yeah, I yeah. think I know the chart you mean. I think it's fallen from two or yeah. three down to less than one. But um, do pretty you, close to one. Yeah. I, I think we had this conversation last time where we were saying that if Bitcoin could scale and could become a really efficient method of exchange as well, you know, that sort of starts to answer a few of those other questions and arguments. But do you think that that just the fact that people that want to save money are savers important in the economy if they have a good no, way to save money? No, no, they're, they're not important uh, because this again is again not understanding macroeconomics properly because individuals can save, societies can't, and the reason is an individual can have a difference between their income and their expenditure. You can sit down every day and work out that your income is greater than your expenditure and therefore saving money, but at the aggregate level, what you spend becomes income for somebody else. Okay, so at the aggregate level, expenditure is identical to income. And therefore, if expenditure is identical to income, there is no savings. Okay, and the, the, the net level of savings is zero in terms of financial. We can save ventilators, we can save hospitals, okay? We can accumulate physical things like that over time. But money itself, the net level, of to, to, the aggregate level, the total level of savings is zero. Now, that is a simple insight from the uh, from the, the post-Keynesian school of economics that I'm part of and the work of monetary theorists on this whole thing. But it then leads to a, a range of uh, implications out of that. If you, in fact, have bank the banking sector, banks, by definition, must have their assets greater than their liabilities. They've got positive equity. If you look at a pure banking system, a, bank, so a pure credit economy, that means that the non-bank sector has got negative equity. Okay. So in that situation, people have negative equity overall. What are they likely to do? Well, they're likely to borrow money from the bank and try to gamble on asset prices and drive the asset prices up. Now, they'll record those assets as being worth the price of the asset times the total number of stock outstanding. And if you do that calculation, it looks like you've all got positive equity. What you've actually got is a housing bubble that you finance by borrowing the money, which will come crashing down at some point, as, it, as has happened so often in human history. So it's an illusion. So you have to say, well, ha we have to find some group that can afford to dissave if the rest of society wants to save. Mm. And who can afford to dissave? Who can actually manage to spend more than their income indefinitely? And the answer is the government because it owns its own bank. So and if you want to have the rest of us saving money and having positive equity and not freaking out about it, you want the government to be running a deficit. What well, is there a different argument in a financial system that's not functioning well like in venezuela if i can save in mm. bitcoin when everything else is getting hyperinflated away it does that you know in that instance oh yeah it's more useful yeah because you've got a, you've, you've got a, you've got an economy that's collapsing in various ways it have exports far less than its imports is running out of american dollars it needs american dollars to import uh you have a collapsing system that way then yes get your money out of that currency and what if um, what if i you know i earn that and it, Ten thousand dollars surplus a year, and that's my capacity to save, as you say. Mm. What happens mm. if inflation? You know, people say stealth inflation is closer to seven percent or whatnot. What if I want to save in my local currency, but I'm being, you know, diluted and inflated away? And Bitcoin is that better store of value because it has a zero percent inflation. Let's say, is that? That's oh, a better storage. It's better storage of value. But if everybody goes for storage of value, you're going to have a decline in economic activity, yeah. and therefore you'll have a rising debt level coming out of it, private debt level. Uh, even government debt level, rising debt level, not because the debt's rising, but because GDP is falling. Yeah. So we have a whole range of ideas about what, what is good for the individual, which we then extrapolate to being good for society as a whole. Individuals should save, therefore it's good for society to save. Garbage, because if you try to save at the aggregate level, you can't. The aggregate of savings is zero. So if you try to save, all you do is slow down the velocity of money, and therefore you get a fall in GDP. And that's, that's, I've written a cartoon book on this front, which is coming out sometime in the next uh, few months. The cartoonist is still working on the actual illustrations. But we, we have all these ideas where we extrapolate from the individual to the collective. And in this particular case, there's an ironclad reason why that's a bad idea, because individuals can have a difference between their expenditure and the income, but societies cannot. Mm. Yeah, no, I definitely think there's going to be a method of payment, whether that's fiat currency or, or cash or stable coins, and then people mm. that want to save in something that's a lot more deflationary, that Bitcoin is maybe that option for the individual, as you say. Um, yeah, let's talk about those central bank digital currencies a little bit more because I think it's really interesting watching how quickly stable coins have grown. And if I mm. want to give you US dollars, it is as easy as downloading an app and clicking a few buttons these days. Whereas if I want to try and give you US dollars through the banking system, 
it's you know it's awfully expensive it's slow there's friction i can't really do it so i think that's an interesting mm-hmm. plumbing for the whole euro dollar system yeah but, but what do you think about the world at the moment owing all those dollars and their currencies even the aussie dollars had a fair tank lately how do you think that sort of plays out with the world and the usd having such a privilege as you said at the start yeah, well, I mean, I, I want to get rid of the American dollar as a reserve currency. I've always been opposed to it. And I want to bring the bank call come in. So in some ways, Donald Trump weaponizing the American dollar has actually helped there because Russia and China and to some extent Europe have been looking at how do they get out of this you know, vice grip of being dominated by the Americans. So there's some possibility of international currency coming out of that, a basket of commodities linked to what would be a, a, a form of international currency like like the bank call was supposed to be. That would be a good development. Um, but... He, in terms of owing America, owing money to the rest of the world, that doesn't matter at all. Because Other this way is around, just, I, think, I meant, sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. America, um, if, the, if the Chinese decide to sell all the bonds that they've got, American bonds, and the Federal Reserve could buy the lot tomorrow. Which is what, what else I've started got? doing, yeah. No, yeah, I meant, I meant yeah, the yeah. other countries around the world that owe all the US dollars back to the that, US. That's, that's, that's deadly because they're running a trade deficit, and this is, the, this is why I'm opposed, I think, running a trade deficit a deficit is a dangerous thing. There's a thing called modern monetary theory, which you know, generally speaking, I'm in favour of, but they have a nonsense idea about uh, international trade, which I think is just silly. Um, exports for a cost, imports for a benefit, and they argue in favour of deficits. That's a very American-centric view. America can get away with it. The rest of the world can't. And now, of course, America's found out that that was a really good idea when you didn't have a coronavirus uh, because, you know, you could get, so you'd send pieces of paper and get ventilators back. Now you send pieces of paper and they get sent back to you and saying, sorry, we're hanging on to the ventilators. Uh, so that's destroyed the manufacturing capability of America. And it now now you're seeing why you need a manufacturing capability. So, uh, but yeah, back to countries running a trade deficit and therefore running out of American dollars. They are forced into austerity to cut back their own spending, reduce their imports and so on. And that's destructive. So I would rather see, again, what Keynes was trying to achieve, where uh, his one of his targets was that trades deficits or surpluses would not exceed 2% of GDP. And there was a whole mechanism set up under the bank core uh, to both force people running a deficit to devalue their currency, which is pretty much what we see now. But it also forced countries to running a surplus to spend that money, uh, either as a, a taxation on their holdings at the central bank or forcing them to make aid to third world countries. Uh, because if you have this uh, focus upon de- devaluing a currency, that is inherently deflationary reducing global demand. Now, of course, at the moment, we're in a whole new world where we're going to have to reduce demand dramatically because of the ecological crisis we're walking blindfolded into. But in terms of if you you didn't have that particular constraint, you don't want this deflationary impact. Uh, You want to have uh, stimulus for the economy. And Keynes had systems built up for that as well. None of this will happen, okay, uh, until we have a crisis. And then it'll be done in a shambles after the event. That's what scares me. Um, are we heading to that crisis now? And I, I mean, the position that countries are already in, as you say, they owe US dollars, their currencies are plunging, mm. their answer is going to be austerity. And that's one of the things that you've argued, you take money out, well, it reduces the size of your economy. And that's yeah. where, where Greece and Italy and whatnot have, have been stuck. So is that going to come undone? Is it, or is it sort of all accelerating now to that point? Yeah, I think it's quite likely you're going to see defaults. If you have a country that where, like, if, if they actually try to, if you try to impose austerity right now in a country which already has a huge plunge in demand because people aren't allowed to work because of the coronavirus, uh, then you're going to devastate them even further, and you're going to have riots in the streets, uh, which you don't want because that'll spread the coronavirus. So at some point, I think a lot of these countries that owe uh, large amounts of American dollars are going to default, and that'd be a good thing. Well, my mum does some work in Tanzania and she sent me a message last okay. night saying that they've defaulted on $10 billion of loans to China. So it's kind yep. of it's mm. starting to happen, I guess, isn't it? And it's the countries that say, well, what have we got to lose? There was an article yeah. out the other day that Argentinian banks are starting to experiment with um, Rootstock, which is a smart contract on to the side of Bitcoin. So I'm just wondering, mm-hmm. do these central banks and currencies that are just getting battered say well should we just buy some gold should we buy some bitcoin start trying to buy up assets because we've got nothing else to back no, up no, they, they don't need it what you've got to, if you have a like in some ways your trade your trade deficit the amount of money you've borrowed to, to balance your trade deficit is a sign of your past industrial uh failures fundamentally and you're trying you, you've now got a world where you can't import anymore uh you have to produce domestically you've got to actually finance that domestic investment uh, exports are going to plunge, so are imports. 
in that thing, you want to be basically lift yourself up by your own bootstraps. Mm -hmm. So you want to be creating fiat money domestically to fund people innovating, establishing new factories to replace overseas overseas design. You'll start stealing ideas, okay? You'll just take apart a vehicle and see how it's made and, and make it yourself. So, you know, there'll be cloned Teslas around the world. Yeah. Um, that sort of thing will start happening. And it's just a sign of how unsustainable the system was beforehand. It's not criminal behaviour now. It's the accumulation of criminal behaviour beforehand that got us in this situation. A lot of that's already been happening in China, I guess, um, really. Mm. That sort of brings me to this last point about Australia. Now, I think it's 60 mm. or 70% services economy these days. Manufacturing has been declining. Mm. Mm. Uh, the US is in a similar position, I guess, aren't they? We've just had all these privileges and people my age that have never had a recession or rainy day in their entire mm. lives. Yeah. Um, what sort of shake up and wake up call are people going through? I mean, in the US, they're already protesting about lock up and they've been in lock up for like two weeks. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, it's, looking, it's looking pretty deadly. I mean, the virus couldn't give a shit about whether you're a capitalist or a socialist economy. It just gives a shit about whether you're standing next to somebody and it could be transmitted from one person to another. Um, and the only way to break it down is, is to cut out human contact outside of your own personal circle for five weeks. Mm. And if we did that globally and financed it for five weeks, we could actually eliminate the virus entirely from the planet, which would be a damn good idea because we can see how damaging it is, not just in terms of how uh, infectious it is. It's, it's got, people are now guessing its infection rate is every person infects five other people, not, not the three they were looking at on average. Of course, there are super spreaders. Uh, it's entirely infectious and it kills about 1% of those who get it. And it also, to those who survive it, can have lasting damage to their organs. It seems to damage livers and damage kidneys. And, you know, even if you think I'm young, I can get over it. If you get a severe dose of it, and a lot of young people are getting it, you'll carry health problems for the rest of your life. It won't be a case of I got through that. It was only, a, you know, no worse than the flu type nonsense. So we have to stop it. And there's actually a there's actually a, a website I recommend people take a look at called endcoronavirus.org. It's put together by a uh, complex system theorist uh, called Yanir uh, Bayam, who's somebody I, I know. Uh, I'll just actually bring up the I mean, site I'll here. I'll just share my thoughts quickly, Steve. As, as a pharmacist, yeah. I think you know um, we got onto this very early as well and helped us avoid the yeah. stock market crash to some degree. Um, I am a believer that the, the rate might actually be lower. We might test and find that a lot of people have antibodies, but I don't think that that really changes anything. The only thing you really need to focus on is that when you let it run through the population, you overrun mm. hospitals. That's what we have to avoid that's right. at that's, all costs. That, that, that's the thing. Yeah, it's the exponential rate of growth of it because and actually, if you have an industrial chemist like um, uh, Merkel running a country, she understands that straight away. So mm. I'm saying if you, if you reduce the infection rate to 1.1, We've got until we, we will never exceed the capacity. If it's 1.2, it'll exceed the capacity in October. 1.3 will exceed it in September, mm. et cetera, et cetera. So you just don't want to get to the stage where you overwhelm your medical system. Yeah. And you know, you're traumatizing your in medical staff. That, that's, that's also happening. You, people are going to have post-traumatic stress disorder out of this when they've saved lives. It's, it's a horrible situation. So it's the infectiousness that's the main danger, not so much the death rate as the infectiousness. And... Um, and, and so we, we, we need people to be aware of that and say, okay, how do we minimise it? And that's why the whole idea from complex systems approach is that if you could isolate everybody for two weeks, you'd find out which family groups have got it, which haven't. Mm. Those that don't have it could be allowed to go back to normal operations. Those that do give it another two weeks until the infection runs through as much as it does the other people in that family, another week after that, we could actually eliminate it from the planet. Yep. Now, of course, we're not going to do that. We're going to have this thing for two or three years if we're lucky. Uh, it's just a sign of how we're thinking about this in an economic ideology way, not in a biological way. And when it comes to something like this, biology trumps economics. Yeah. And I do understand the counter arguments because people, you know, suicide rates go up when you people lose jobs and all that sort of thing as well. So the ideal scenario mm -hmm. here is really widespread testing. We hope that a lot of young people do have immunity to it and you can't get reinfected. So people test for those antibodies. We hope yeah. that we get some better treatments, um, a, a vaccine eventually, and people can go yeah. back to work. Maybe mask wearing becomes the norm. But um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the ideal outcome and everything's back to reasonable within normal within sort of by the end of the year. But uh, yeah, don't worry, Steve. I've, uh, I've got one there as well. So <laughs> We'll finish the interview off. No, there's no sense showing it because it's so easy to get this <laughs> stuff in Thailand. That's why I moved here. Um, every, all this stuff is absolutely available here. This, this cost um, um, two and a half baht each, which 
I think it's about 20 cents or 10 cents. Well, it's funny. In the pharmacy, you be, you could buy a box of 100 for $2 and they'd gather dust on the shelf. And now they're selling for 10 or $15 each in Sydney Airport. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, 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 the Australian government has enforced a price of 10 baht for four. Mm. Um, and then now I mean, that includes a 20% profit margin for the manufacturer. They're not being sent bankrupt by this at all. It just means they don't have profiteering. So... Asian societies are much better off about this than the, than the West is, and that's going to be, I think, one of the persistent lessons out of this. Countries that have a more of an acceptance of a role for the state are going to do better out of this crisis than those that don't. So just quickly, Australia, um, we still seem to think that we're, I guess, different, and there's talk of housing is going to recover strongly and, and whatnot. Are we going to learn a hard lesson about manufacturing and how, yeah, how yeah, lucky we have yeah, and I was part of the by, by the group that wrote the Accord document back in the uh, 1980s before Hawke and Keating turned it into wage restraint. It wasn't just them, it was the, the neoclassical economists and, and the bureaucracy who did it as well. But the whole idea was to build a manufacturing sector and it got turned into wage restraint and inflation control and the whole superannuation con job. Um, so we, we, we're saying, look, you cannot have a country that doesn't have its own manufacturing capability. Now, of course, we've got to the stage where the car industry is now gone. We never had a domestic car industry. It's always the foreign multinationals producing cars. Um, but you don't have the manufacturing capability. And all of a sudden, uh, you're going to need it because the, the whole long supply chains we've been using to exploit low wages in the third world, they're gone. Uh, because that, that in itself gives a way of enabling the virus to spread further. Uh, you're going to have to quarantine uh, ship crews for two weeks before and uh, before they get onto a boat to make sure nobody's got it. Um, the 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 cost of that manufacturing going to go through the roof. Mm -hmm. So and you don't have any exports to to give it to you because again the demand for uh, coal is going to plunge. The demand for oil um, may also plunge. You know, it's just, and it, 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 as much as it's done and, and stay dramatically lower than it was before the crisis. So all this stuff is going to mean Australia has got a hollowed out um, manufacturing sector. All it's got, as uh, David Llewellyn Smith puts it, is houses and holes. And, um, you know, the holes aren't necessarily going to be dug up as fast in the, in the past, and, and the houses being expensive actually makes you less competitive. One reason that the cost is so low in a country like Thailand is I'm renting this four-bedroom, two-storey house for about 500 US Australian dollars a month. And, and the reason behind that is if I'm in Sydney, 50% of my income is going to a mortgage yeah. for my lifetime or in my peak spending years as opposed to yeah. 20% and I'm spending 30% in the economy. Yeah, yeah. And we should be the other way around. Michael Hudson made this point very well. The, the, the fire sector has made the, the West uncompetitive compared to the East. If we didn't have these ridiculous house prices, you could have lower rents and lower mortgages and people would have a lower cost of living and therefore the, the cost of manufacturing would be lower as well, which I can see so vividly in Thailand, having lived here now for over a month. Mm. Um, so we've, we've conned ourselves into thinking high house prices are a good thing, they're a bad thing. Yeah. Final question, debt jubilee, wipe the slate clean and restart yeah. or print our way out of it like central banks are doing at the moment? Debt jubilee. I mean, it, it, it's, this is something I argued for back back in 2011. I think I last edited my document on that on my website in 2012. But the whole idea is we allow too much credit money to be created, not enough fiat-based money. So you let the government create the fiat-based money and inject it into people's bank accounts on a per capita basis, which itself reduces some of the inequality caused by both the rise in debt and QE itself, as it was practiced by central banks. Uh, those that have debt can pay their debt down. Those that don't have debt get a cash injection. Yeah. You could control that and say that money has to be used to buy new corporate shares, which would then be used to pay down corporate debt. So you could actually reduce corporate debt as well as household and to some extent democratise the ownership of capital in the country. Uh, mm -hmm. That's something like that. And then by reducing the debt burden, it would be cheaper to start manufacturing again. That's a similar thought to, well, if you're going to bail out Virgin, you know, take ownership of that sort of thing, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Now, is, yeah, that, again, yeah. is that answer what they should do or what you actually think they will do with the Jubilee? What they should do. I mean, this is, the banking sector will still get in there and try to distort the hell out of it and get hold of the money themselves. That's what happened with the Troubled Asset Recovery Program, TARP, in America under, under um, um, Paulson and co. It was supposed to go to uh, help homeowners to a large extent service their debts and get out of their, their mortgages. Uh, instead, it was just used to pump up the assets of uh, the, the financial sector. So they'll be conning this all the way, and they're most likely likely to succeed. The, the trouble is this time round, the damage to the economy is so much greater than the financial crisis that you might well get political um, pushback out of that from 
a angry and in America armed uh, working class and middle class. This time around, you've got 20 or 30% of people watching the news each night and hopefully watching Nuggets news as well, Steve. <laughs> cool. Well, mate, that's been absolutely fantastic. Always learn so much. Um, even if you don't agree with Steve's views, guys, I, I love having different opinions on the show. So I'll put the links down below to support Steve's Patreon and check out those books that he said. Any final words for people, Steve? Oh, just yeah, on the Patreon front, most of my posts, there are free. Uh, people think it's actually you can't go there because it's behind Patreon. I actually asked my patrons early on, they want my stuff to be for them only or general access. They said definitely general access. So only the podcasts are, are, are behind a paywall. Um, and even some of those, I think one in four we actually release. So, um, yeah, don't, don't be put up by Patreon behind one of my posts. It's, you don't have to pay me money to read this stuff. I'd appreciate it if you did, but you don't have to. And did you get a Bitcoin donation to address in the end, Steve? <laughs> I think I have, but I don't even look at it. You know, I mean, I, I, I've never been a speculator and I'm not about to change now. Okay, awesome. Well, mate, thanks for joining us today. I hope you guys have appreciated that and we'll talk again soon. Cheers. Okay.